Thank you so much for having me here again, and it's always delightful to be here, really, with, uh, uh, with you. And um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is um, the <coughs> whole uh, phenomenon, I would call it, of near-death experiences. And um, to talk at first a little bit about how I got interested in this personally, um, I came from a family where religion was just not in the cards. My dad was a combat surgeon in World War II from the Pacific Theater. And um, as I gather in retrospect, because that generation didn't talk, I imagine that what happened to him was that he was very turned off by religion because of what he had seen in World War II. And um, my mother's mother um, was always making um, sort of uh, kind but very humorous remarks about religion. And I just grew up, to me, religion was not a part of my life. And um, I grew up um, with an interest in astronomy, actually, from the age of eight. And um, the idea of an afterlife was something, and quite literally, my only contact with the notion of an afterlife when I was a young person was through the cartoons and the New Yorker magazine, I remember, with the angels and so on. And um, it never occurred to me as a young person that anybody took that question of an afterlife seriously. And so at the age of 18, I went to the University of Virginia with the intention of being an astronomer. But um, I had gotten interested in philosophy in high school, and so I took a philosophy course my first year at the University of Virginia. And um, the first book we read was Plato's Republic. And literally in the first few pages of that book, I can show you exactly on the page where I decided I'm going to be a philosophy student. And um, um, so, um, Plato was the very first person I ever knew who took this notion of an afterlife seriously. To me, I thought it was a joke. And yet, in reading the first few pages of The Republic, I realized that this man who, even to this day, is my hero, took this question seriously. And that woke me up to the importance of it. And you may remember, if you read The Republic, that it closes with a story of a warrior who was believed dead on the battlefield, but spontaneously revived during his funeral and talked about going into another realm. And I was so fascinated by that. Um, and so I talked with my professor, Lewis Hammond, about this. And he told me that, yeah, not only Plato, but many of these early Greek philosophers were fascinated by these stories of people who were believed dead and revived. So that was the co the in my introduction to it. It never occurred to me that this might be something that pertained to then 20th century America. I just assumed it was a Greek thing. But in 1965, I met at the University of Virginia Professor George Ritchie, who was a psychiatry professor, who had had an amazing experience when he had been pronounced dead some years before. And when I heard Dr. Ritchie talk about this in 1965, I knew one thing, and that was that, that whatever this was, it was, that it was real to Dr. Ritchie. In other words, it never occurred to me at all that he was being insincere. He was. To this day, George was the finest human being I ever knew in my life. So from that point on, I took it seriously as something more than just an ancient Greek story. Went on to get my PhD in philosophy and then taught philosophy for three years in a university and then went on to medical school and became a psychiatrist. And throughout that process, I have had the great privilege and honor of talking with literally thousands of people from all over the world who came to the brink of death and who had an experience on the verge of death that 
totally changed their lives. Um, throughout this process, I must ad admit, I knew that these people were sincere, but the idea that, uh, that we would ever know for sure whether there is or isn't an afterlife, to me just was not very realistic. I, I never uh, suspected when I was a younger person that I might reach a point in my life where I really seriously entertained the notion that it was a reality. But through a long process, I've now come to the point where I do accept that to my utter astonishment, this is a reality. Um, by the way, I would never try to convince anybody else of that. But to me, um, I have really reached the point where I give up and try, have given up trying to account for this by any other means than to introduce the notion that to my utter astonishment, we do seem to survive death. Now, um, to talk a little bit about, first of all, um, what is it that people tell us when they come to the brink of death and are revived? And unless you have been hiding out in the high Himalayas for the last 40 years, which maybe some of you have, um, you've no doubt heard this, but always there are a few people who maybe this is an initial introduction um, to this subject. So w what I will describe now is not, not just what I have learned from people I've talked with, but also now multiple physicians all over the world have investigated these experiences, and we find that they are very similar all over the world. And that is that basically people tell us that when, for example, they undergo a cardiac arrest from which they are resuscitated, um, they, they tell us that very often they actually hear the doctor or nurse or some other person present say su something such as, oh my God, he's dead, or we've lost her, or words to that effect, which surprises them because a, a, a statement I hear uh, in various wordings, but the same thought from people literally all over the world, I've heard this, that people tell me that, in effect, I have never been so alive as when I heard that doctor say I was dead. Because what people tell us is that at this point where they hear themselves pronounced de dead, from their point of view, they tell us that they actually exit their physical body and they um, rise up and they look down and, and they say that they can see from above the scene of the resuscitation. They see their own bodies lying and now apparently dead at the scene of an accident or on the table of the operating room. And um, they, they become aware that they can understand what is going on among the doctors and nurses down below. This, they say it's not like you hear a physical voice or an auditory sensation, but rather that you become aware of what the doctors or nurses are thinking. And that from this point of view, they, they naturally would try to ask to the doctor, how can it be that I'm up above my body here looking at you down below? But they quickly are aware that the doctor and nurse are unable to hear them or to understand them. They may, for example, to try to get the doctor's attention by touching the him or her um, to get their attention, but they find that when they do, they can make no contact. It's like they they go through the body of the doctor or nurse. And quickly in this situation, become aware or begin to formulate to themselves the idea that this has to do with death. And at that point, people enter into a state of consciousness that no matter how articulate they may be or however many languages they may speak, People all over the world tell me that 
there are no words for this, that this is something that lies beyond their ability to put it into words. And another thing that people say is that although listening to these accounts that we might tend to think first that this is a dreamlike state, that, that the people are in a, a sort of surrealistic dreamlike state. From the perspective of the patient, it's quite the opposite. That they tell us that as they enter into this state, that they become aware that this is the dream and that very rapidly in this process, people begin to withdraw from the body. Um, you know, it, Americans and people all over the world now, when they, they talk about this, they, they tend to say, um, I got out of my body, okay, is the way we naturally put it. But I've always been intrigued by the fact that, uh, if, for example, in Plato's writings and the Phaedo, which is the great dialogue that Plato wrote about the afterlife, and Socrates is dying in this dialogue, it's the scene of his execution. Socrates says, not that I got out of my body, but I withdrew from my body. Which is, I think about it, if you think about it, that puts it the other way around, right? Like in the West, we say, I got out of my body, which the, the origin point is the body. But Socrates, in his description of this, says, I, it's like a withdrawal from the body, which puts the, the locus of consciousness or the self, as it were, in the, the not in the body, but, but in the self. Um, but at, at any rate, um, people will say, as you will hear Evan say tomorrow night about his experience, that, um, that you enter into a hyper-real state I hear people all over the world say that this was more real than real and that totally lying beyond words. And yet, worldwide, um, very similar descriptions. People say that they feel that they go through a tunnel or a passageway of some sort and come out on the other side into this incredibly brilliant and warm and comforting light and people say that in this light they experience a love that is so profound that we can only use the word love that we have on this plane analogously with that, that it's, it's far beyond any love that we can experience while we're alive. And in this light, tell us that um, um, feelings of love, comfort, peace that are beyond description. And often in that light also, um, tell us that forms or spirits of loved ones that they had while they were alive are there in the role almost of a greeting committee to help them through this transition. And people say that in this uh, state, if for example you see your grandfather, that the person you meet there in that light as your deceased grandfather is no longer limited by time. You don't see them as any particular age, but rather timeless, and not in a physical vehicle, but rather in some sort of vehicle, which they describe it seems to have a geometry, but again, in some way that they find it impossible to put into words. And as this experience progresses, say that um, is the way this is often described to me that people say that in this light, that suddenly the light gets even brighter and everything else just sort of disappears. And they find themselves in this environment or state of consciousness um, Sometimes I think of it almost like one of those funhouse mirrors where you go in and you see just infinite images of yourself going off into eternity. That people say that <coughs> time stands still, that they are no longer in a timeless state, and that they are surrounded by a holographic, full-color, 
panorama, which consists, they say, of every single action that they have ever undertaken in their lives. But in this timeless state, when you see each action of your life portrayed there, suddenly you are no longer in the consciousness that you had when you performed that action, rather that you are embodied, embodied in the consciousness, empathically embodied in the consciousness of the person with whom you interacted. Hence, if you see yourself doing something unkind to somebody else, as we all have, then when that action has its result, you are empathically feeling that from the point of view of the person with whom you um, interacted. So if you see yourself doing something unkind, then you feel the sadness you brought about. Or if you um, see yourself doing a kind-hearted or loving action to one of your fellow human beings, then you are embedded in that person and you feel the good feelings that you brought about. Very often people say that they um, review this panorama um, along with a, an enlightened being, a, as this way this is described as a being of complete compassion and love and light, who is there all, almost in the role of a tutor to sort of direct your attention to different parts of this. And um, people say that even though it's experienced timelessly, that because language is sequential, when they relate it to us, they have to relate it as though it were a sequence, because that's how language is. But in the experiencing of it, it's not sequential. Everything is there at once. And um, as a logician, I don't like to make inferences. You know, it's what's the big rush to make judgments or conclusions. To me, I like to think about things. Um, and um, yet, at a certain point, I'm compelled to draw a conclusion about this panorama that's quite apart from any questions about an afterlife. But I think if we just think about this panorama, we can draw with a high degree of certitude a conclusion that is utterly astonishing to me in its implications, but seems to follow completely, you know, with certitude, and that is that apparently, at least for some of us, life is a two-phase process. Apparently, apparently, we live life forward as the actor or protagonist, and then at the end, there's this totally, you know, 180-degree turnaround, and we relive that same identical action from the point of view of the other characters involved which is rather startling to me, that life is two phases. And um, so, at some point, obviously, all of these people have to make a return trip back here. And um, what I find is that different people have different accounts of how they got back. Some people have no idea. They say at one moment they were in this light in a timeless state and at the next moment they were back in their physical bodies with no sense of transition. Other people tell us that they were told they had to come back, that somebody there, perhaps a deceased relative or this presence of light, says you have to go back, you have things left to do, which is very frustrating for people because I've never known anybody who was told that he had to go back for any particular purpose. Rather, it's just you have to go back, there's things left to complete. But what that is, you know, they're left in the dark. So imagine that situation. Yet I've noticed over the years, I've known many of these people for decades, and in the passage of years, many times they do eventually realize why it was that they were sent back. But, you know, when they come back, they're in, it's like being propelled out of the this light back into the um, rather unreal world we're, we're in with no sense of exactly what it is that they're supposed to be doing. Um, other people...
<coughs> tell us that they were given a choice, that they could either uh, proceed with this light experience they were having <coughs> or that they could return to the world they had been living in. And uh, not too surprisingly, all of the ones that I told were given that choice, you know, chose to come back here. But um, what is so intriguing is that almost always it's the same reason. Um, well, in one way, it always is the same reason. Namely, they say they come back for somebody else. Um, but it's most typically, it's that they say that they have young children left to raise. So they come back to, um, thank you, to raise their children. Um, now, when they do get back, it's get, it gets very interesting because... Um, um, I didn't learn much in psychiatry, actually. I mean, and about uh, um, uh, from my psychiatry training, except a very small number of things. One I learned for sure. I learned what normal is, and uh, I can tell you exactly what normal is. Normal is somebody you don't know very well, right? <laughs> and. Um, that's one thing I learned. But another thing I learned was that everybody seems to be chasing something. That was so startling to me when I began to um, uh, do psychotherapy work, for example. And I told my supervisor, John Buckman, that I just, it's like amazing to me that everybody's chasing something. Because honestly, in my ignorance, I honestly thought I wasn't chasing anything. And I thought, some people chased power, so, which I could s tell was such an illusion, or some people chased fame, which is so, not just an illusion, but a scary illusion. Um, and some people chased money, which I had, wish I had chased more money now, I will <laughs> say, having two, two kids, you know, at this age. But I never did chase money. Not that I disdained it, but I just found my work was more interesting than money. But um, I was sort of going on like this to John, and he looked at me and he said, Raymond, how old were you when I, you finished your second doctoral degree? And I said, 30. And he said, well, and I realized at that point, yeah, I was chasing knowledge, right? And, and still am. But um, what it was so startling to me when I began to hear all these patients who were chasing things. And then I got to reflecting on all the people with near-death experiences that I had interviewed. And what I saw was that um, whatever they had been chasing, um, money or power or fame or any of these other things, that when they came back from this experience, that what they all said unanimously was that what this life is all about is primarily, first and foremost, to learn to love. Because that's what everybody saw in the, this panorama, that the things that were more satisfying, most satisfying about this life was the instances in which they had been uh, learning to love. And um, then, Secondly, and almost like as a little grace note, or that people would also mention that in this panorama where there would be scenes in which they had been learning something, that this presence they were in would sort of focus in on these things in a positive way. And um, one thought that often came out of this, all, none of this was in words, but then later people would try to put it into words, was that in effect, they, they felt that this presence was, to try to translate it, saying something like, even when you die, this process of learning goes on. And, and this uh, George Ritchie that I mentioned uh, said to me one time, he said, Raymond, I gather from my experience, he said, that this, the quest for knowledge goes on quite literally, he said, for eternity that it never stops, which is very satisfying to me personally. <laughs> um, and so another difficulty about this is that people say they come back with this insight 
that the most important thing that we can do while we're alive is to learn to love, but it doesn't make it any easier. As I like to say, you know, as, as George Ritchie once said to me in, in a very oblique way, he said, this experience makes your humanity even more of a burden in a way. And to translate it crudely, what George was saying was that, let's face it, it's very difficult to get through the average day without wanting to choke at least one person. <laughs> and that's the reality of our human lives. And people will say that this continues, that even after you have this vision, you still find yourself, you know, flying off the handle at people and regretting it but that this awareness that they have that life is a sort of quest and that we go through these learning experiences. And of course they come back from this saying um, that they have no more fear of death because they learned from their experience that what we call death is simply a transition into some other realm of existence. Now, Again, like I said, you've all heard this story, I'm sure. I mean, it's become now a part of our ethos. And these near-death experiences where they were essentially unknown in 1975 are now worldwide knowledge. And ev everybody knows this. It's incorporated into the movies and our, um, our collective consciousness in a new way. And. Um, so the very real question arises with these things is um, can we use this to give us a rational proof of an afterlife? And, um, and that I think is a very important question. If we really could have a rational proof of an afterlife, um, I think things in the world would be very different. But I don't mean necessarily um, in a, in a way that would be um, make this world delightful and, and that we would all be propelled into a, a blissful state. Over the years, a, a lot of people have come to me who've um, been on a mission to try to improve the world with these things. And uh, the first being this wonderful man named Jim McDonnell of McDonnell Douglas Aircraft. And Jim, uh, Jim came to me in 1976 trying to see if I would, would work with him in a, in a scientific research project to prove the afterlife, which as much as I love Jim, I declined because I thought that, um, number one, it's a delusion to think that the question of an afterlife is a scientific question. Um, the West is full of this doctrine of scientism, which holds that the only rational way of solving questions is through the rational, is through the scientific method of inquiry. And that is a fallacy. Um, and by the way, I am a lover of science. I mean, oh yeah, I just love science. But scientism is a different thing. Scientism is a, is a doctrine that, as I said, the only rational way of, of establishing knowledge is through the scientific method. But I used to teach epistemology or theory of knowledge when I was a philosophy professor. And in the first couple of days of class, I would ask my students, like, well, what do you think knowledge is? And I quickly learned from experience that in that circumstance, um, what the kids come up with is that knowledge is science, right? And so, and so I would get them to talk for a while, and then what they'd eventually say is that the only rational means of, of establishing knowledge is through the scientific method. So I would put that statement up on the board. Scientific method is the only rational means of establishing knowledge. And then I would say, well, is that what you think? And you know, the kids would say, yeah, that's what I think. So then I would draw a rectangle around that statement. And I would say, well, how do you know that? Now, if you think about it for a minute, they have only two options. Number one, they say, they could say, I know it by the scientific method. 
But that's the fallacy called reasoning in a circle, where you just assume what you set out to prove. But then if they said, on the other hand, that, well, I know it through philosophy or literary theory or history, then that's a self-contradiction, because to say scientific method is the only rational means of knowing things, and I know that by philosophy or, you know, is self-contradictory. So science is one thing, and scientism is another thing. And um, so it's been a very long struggle for me to come to terms with the idea that uh, Maybe we can know by rational means that there's an afterlife, but not at, not, it's not going to be science at first that brings us to this. I think it would be philosophical inquiry. And the way this has been handled in philosophy since the time of the Greeks is the same way we do it today. There are some people who look at these um, these experiences and they take them at face value and say, yeah, this is evidence of an afterlife. And Plato would be in that category. He took this seriously. Meanwhile, his contemporary Democritus was the founder of the scientific method. Uh, I'm sorry, of the Democritus was the founder of the atomic theory of matter. Uh, it, Democritus had just reasoned it out that contrary to our sense perception that tells us, for example, that this stage right here is a solid object, which is, I'm sitting on it and that assumption, but um, it looks as though it's a continuum with no breaks to it, right? But Democritus just reasoned it out that contrary to our sense perception, this has to be made up of tiny little bits that are too small for us to see, and a atoms. And he wrote a book on near-death experiences, which we don't have because he didn't have a school like Plato did, so his writings got separated. But in his book, he said, there's no such thing as a moment of death. And what he was meant was just like people you see on TV today who say, yeah, this is just brain damage, or, you know, this is just the oxygen deprivation to the brain is what creates these hallucinations. Um, and, and so that form of debate has been unchanged for 2,300 years. That's how people debate it. Some people say, well, it really is the afterlife. Some people say, no, it's just an artifact of the oxygen deprivation to the brain. And um, so how do we solve that dilemma? Well, personally, I don't think it's much of a dilemma because it's never, I've never taken seriously this idea that these things are artifacts of the brain process. Why? Because, number one, philosophically, uh, it's people who are neuroscientists um, get convinced by all that stuff that they uh, do and learn about in school, and um, they really think that the brain generates consciousness. But that is just a philosophical position. It's not a scientific question. How are you going to know that the brain generates consciousness? You can't really tell by any experiment. And um, that's one thing. But also, at the end of my f first quarter of medical school, one of my own professors um, approached me and she said, uh, Dr. Moody, I've been wanting to meet you. She said, and she gave her name, which I re immediately recognized as a very distinguished professor of medicine. And she said, I had an experience I want to tell you about. So she led me across the campus to her um, um, office, and this is what she told me, that some while before she had been resuscitating her own mother. She had walked in and her mother was having a cardiac arrest. So she tried her best to resuscitate her mother, but it didn't work and her mother died. But she said when she felt her mother die, she herself lifted up from her body and observed down below. She could see her own body down below and her, mo her mother's now deceased body. And um, 
she was startled by this. Like me, she had not really had any sort of religious background to prepare her for this. But she said in her astonishment, she was, to use her words, she said, I was trying to get my bearings. And she became aware of her mother there beside her, to use her words again, now in <laughs> spirit form. So she said her goodbyes to her mother, and she saw her mother recede into this light, and she saw figures coming out of the light, some of whom she identified as people she knew who had been friends or relatives of her mother's who had died. And then uh, she saw her mother disappear into this light, and then she herself came back to her own body and was standing there beside the body of her mother. And um, so it was immediately obvious to me that it's if these things are the result of the oxygen deprivation to the brain, why would a bystander who was not ill or injured have identically the same experience? So we're dealing with something else entirely here. And it's very common for bystanders at the death of someone else to have all of the features that we think of as a near-death experience. People uh, who are standing by, for example, may say that as the person in the bed dies, that they themselves seem to, um, they, they can see what appears to be a spirit, for want of a better term, leave the body. I hear this from relatives at the bedside of a dying loved one. I hear it all the time from physicians. Who, who tell me that they see something leave the body. I hear from people who tell me that when their loved one dies or when a patient dies, that they themselves feel that they leave their bodies and they go upwards toward this light part way toward with the dying person. Then they come back and rejoin their bodies. Or people at the bedside of the dying may tell us that um, the room seems to fill with light, or that they may see apparitions of what are apparently the dying person's um, um, deceased relatives and friends coming in the room to sort of take the person away. And I even have cases in which the bystander uh, tells me that they empathically uh, co-live the dying life review of the person who passes away. And this is a shocker to me because, you know, I'm not even looking forward to sitting in on my own life review, <laughs> much less the idea that there could be a spectator there. You know, it's like <laughs> pass the popcorn or something. <laughs> but what is remarkable to me about this is how natural it's described. People say that you would think of this as some shocking thing, but no, it's, it's completely natural, which makes a certain amount of sense to me in that, um, you know, as a psychiatrist, I learned that pretty much everybody has the same secrets, right? I mean, it's, it's secrets are very familiar to all of us. And, um, and also another thing you would think about this is that surely this occurs only to somebody who is very close to the person, would have a, a review of the life. And that's what I thought for a long time until just a few months back we got a communication from a physician who was telling us that um, he was called to the ER to see a patient who was having a cardiac arrest, that he had never laid eyes on this patient. But he said when he was trying to resuscitate this man, he said he was flooded with images, which plainly were this man's life flashing through the mind of the doctor. So um, I, we are into something very, very mysterious here. And um, it's, I've been through a process where it's just very, very, I have a great deal of reluctance to draw a conclusion about this, and yet, Things happen that are just very hard to put together. Um, as a little background on this, I would say that um, um, one thing I've noticed in the last couple of years is that when I lecture now, medical doctors are flocking to my lectures. And this, this is a decided shift 
And um, what this is all about is that these near-death experiences are so common now that no longer is the medical community able to ignore them. I mean, we've got to make some sort of statement about them. And, and I would refer you to a fascinating series of articles in a journal called Missouri Medicine. And Missouri Medicine is the state is the medical journal of the State Medical Association of Missouri, and it's one of the most eminent and respected medical journals in the United States. And they have just recently finished an 18-month series of articles by physicians who've had near-death experiences or who have interviewed uh, lots of patients who have had them. And um, as a philosopher, it's kind of shocking to me and because I see these statements in this, in this medical journal, oh yeah, there's an afterlife. And to me that's still just very shocking that um, in the pages of respected medical journals now, the people are saying, well yeah, you know, there's, it startles me, but, but there is an afterlife. Um, one of the people who wrote this, and it might be somebody you might be interested to have down here, um, his name is Anthony Sicoria, and he's just a delightful person. Anthony has uh, what we call in psychiatry the oral personality. He's kind of round, and he's very, his whole focus in life is to um, serve other people. He's very jovial. And Anthony, um, in 1996, was hit in the neck by a bolt of lightning, which exited his ankle, and he had a cardiac arrest. And um, fortunately, a nurse was right there, and she resuscitated him. But he had this amazing experience, which he describes in this medical journal. And um, Anthony had never had any interest whatsoever in music. But after this, he began to develop this fascination with the piano. And now, in addition to being a respected professor of orthopedic surgery at NYU, who in addition to his MD has a PhD in physiology, is now an accomplished concert pianist. And um, so, and he would be a very interesting person, I think, for, for you to talk with here. So um, all of these things, I've just been fighting for years against this, this idea that there is. But um, I was saying to the Swami last night, I, in April, I went to uh, Italy to lecture. And again, because of this renewed interest in the medical community, uh, there was a flock of doctors there, and after my lecture, this one man came, and he was a surgeon in Italy, and he, um, his face was haunted, for a better term, but I don't mean in a negative way. It was just that I looked into his face, and I realized that here was a man who had undergone something that had just totally changed his world. And so he led me away into the corner, <laughs> And um, this is what he told me, that a few months before, he had been doing an elective surgical procedure on a fairly young man who was in good health. Okay. <laughs> and uh, there w this was not even, even a very serious surgery, so there was not any expectation or even vague intuition that anything might go wrong. But in the event, the patient had a cardiac arrest, and so the surgeon was unable to revive him. And so he was so distressed, and he was thinking, oh my God, it's like, what happened? And what am I going to say to the family? And all these thoughts were whirling through his head, whereupon he said the, the swinging doors of the operating suite came open, and a woman came raving in. And he said she was, he thought at first that this was a psychotic person. And you know how when you're distressed about something, you have a hard time putting together what somebody else is saying because you're so 
full of your own thoughts. So he said he couldn't make sense of what this woman was saying. So he focused in on her face and listened, and he realized that she was saying, my husband is not dead. And um, so um, he said that she said, I was out in the waiting room, and my husband came to me, and he said that for me to come in here and tell you that he's not dead because you think he's dead. And so the surgeon told me that he was so flabbergasted he doesn't even remember resuming the resuscitation. But somehow he did. It just automatically took over. And he said, sure enough, after a little while, the patient's heart started beating again. And the doctor told me that he was there in the uh, recovery room when the patient regained consciousness. And he said the first thing the patient said to him was, I was out of my body up there looking at you, and I could tell you thought I was dead. And I kept trying to tell you I'm not dead. But you wouldn't hear me, so I went out into the waiting room, and I told my wife to come in here and tell you I'm not dead. <laughs> and as seemingly absurd in a way that the whole notion of an afterlife is, because it's self-contradictory, right? I mean, death just means the final irreversible cessation of, death, of life. So to say there's life after death means there's life after the final irreversible cessation of life. In a way, it doesn't make sense. And yet at a certain point, you're compelled to say something. And um, Alfred North Whitehead once said, um, in formal logic, a self-contradiction is regarded as a sign of defeat. He said, in the real evolution of knowledge, a self-contradiction is often a gateway into a whole new realm of knowledge. And I think that we may be in that situation now. And so I think that it's now f actually conceivable to me that we may be in a situation now where we're going to have to wake up to the reality that we might, at some point in the future, have a genuine rational proof of an afterlife. And what would that do to the human condition? Well, this Jim McDonald I mentioned, the reason he wanted to get a proof of an afterlife was that he thought that that would bring the world together and there'd be no conflict. Well, I don't buy that. I mean, I hope it's true. But I think that people would just still be about the same, really. Um, but one, in, in the terms of their conflicts and so on, but one thing I do seriously, take very seriously here, is that I think that the process of rational proof of an afterlife would absolutely change the nature of the kind of beings we are. Because um, the great skeptic David Hume said, by the mere light of reason, it seems difficult to prove the immortality of the soul. Uh, and he went on to say, some new species of logic is required for that purpose, and some new faculties of the mind that they may enable us to comprehend that logic. And I do think that the very process of constructing a rational proof of an afterlife would do something to the nature of the human person where we would no longer be exactly the same kind of beings. We would be something different. So to me, this idea of proof of an afterlife is a very exciting prospect. Then I got to thinking, as I've talked about a couple of years ago here, it's like then I got to thinking, well, is if there's an afterlife, what is this all about? And um, I, one of my favorite writers when I was a kid was Elie Wiesel. And I remember in one of Elie's books, he said, um, God made man because he loves stories. And I think that's pretty right. I think that this thing we're in is like story, right? It's like, as I gather, you we go through one life, it's kind of like a drama, and then 
at the end of it, we go through some incomprehensible process, and then we're just off another, on another one of these stories. And um, so I've, I've arrived at this same feeling that apparently the Hinduism has, right? It's like very similar, that this is a great theater that we're in. And um, in one way, that sounds like a logical, con or just a logical fallacy, because people could say, well, what you're doing is you're taking this one aspect of human life, like the theater, right? And that what you're doing is you're projecting that out into the universe as a model of the whole. And that would be a fallacy. But I think it's very different. I think that the reason why we have theater is that people, dis, you know, woke up to this, this aspect of life. I did some um, geriatric psychiatry for about a year before I went into forensic psychiatry. And um, I had a lot of patients with Pick's disease and Alzheimer's disease and all these dementing processes. But I also had plenty of patients who were very cognitively sharp, many of them sharper than me. and. Um, and yet they were just there for a situational stress or whatever. And repeatedly I heard from people who are about my age now, you know, this thing that the older they got, they told me, the more the impression developed when they looked back and through their life that it had been a script or a sort of play. And now I'm reaching that point where I see that myself. I think it's developmental. And I think the reason we have theater is that people saw that. You know, I mean, that, you know, if you, the, the history of the theater is one of the most amazing stories of history. Basically, what happened in about, say, 580 BC, I think it was, the Athenians had this um, folk festival they did every year, and it was a chorus would sing these stories. But this one day, for reasons unknown, this one guy, Thespis, stepped forward from the chorus and spoke his own lines. And it created a sensation. And the ruler of Athens at that time was Pisistratus. And you know, the Greeks, what they love is contests, right? The athletics, for example. So everything is a contest to the Greeks. So Pisistratus said, let's have a contest. And so they is to see who could write the best, uh, the best one of these. The first contestant was Aeschylus, and he won. And his innovation we made, he was he made it two characters. Then came Sophocles. And his innovation was, there's three characters now. And then came Euripides, and then it's a cast, right? That took 50 years from the point of where that originated to the point where the theater was a profession. And that means to me that that is something deeply ingrained in us. The biggest thing that the scholars of the theater have to figure out, they just don't understand, was how they got people to sit still for so long to pay attention. Because you know, the, the athletics, they're jumping up and down, but how did they get people to sit still? Because it's in us already. So that's where I've come to with this, that I think um, that we're living in a kind of theater, just like as I hear from my friends here, that that's kind of what the, the Hindu model of this is. And um, read a playwright not long ago who said, a play is just a life with the boring parts taken out. And you know, it's very interesting that it, it, this closing things in our life, what we do is we get to see the play from the other point of view. I mean, I just think that's neat. Who else could have figured that out but God? You know? <laughs> now, um, this is a little bit off the cuff because I just, uh, you know, Eben is not feeling well tonight, so I've, I've um, um, taken on this, but I d I'm not even sure how long we have tonight, but I want to, at this point, um, to sort of set the scene, and maybe if I have time for a couple of questions, I don't know. Five minutes? Yeah, let's have questions for about five minutes in case um, anybody... Yes, w was there an empathic death experience for somebody who came back? I see what you mean. <laughs>
In other words, yes, to a degree. And that's that all the time I hear people say that, um, that they become acutely aware of what the bystanders were saying, thinking, and going on. Is that what you meant? Yes. Who died but came back. Yes. Nothing like that comes to mind, but I bet there are. I just, I can't bring one up. But uh, I hear all the time, yes, yes, immediately I think of one. Um, and I mentioned him a couple of years ago when I was down here. He's um, a graphic artist who... Um, was in this horrible car crash in which his wife was killed and one of his sons was killed. And he had a near-death experience. And um, so this affected him very deeply and he was, he was writing up this experience. He lost a leg and uh, just, just a terrible tragedy. And so he... Um, he um, He's, when I met him several years ago, he was writing this up, which I encouraged him to do, because I think that's how artists process things, right? So then, about four years ago, he sent me the manuscript, which he had done on, done on this, and it was a very good manuscript. But then he called me back a couple of weeks later, and he said that um, in writing his manuscript, he realized that he pretty much had to... Um, mentioned the name of the trauma surgeon who saved his life. But he hadn't told the trauma surgeon about this because patients generally don't tell their doctors for obvious reasons. So he telephoned the doctor and asked, you know, invited him to lunch. And when the doctor came, he told him the near-death experience he had during the surgery. Whereupon he said the surgeon became very um, solemn and said, well, I've never told anybody this, but that night you came into the hospital, I knew you weren't going to die because I talked to your wife in the operating room so who has been killed in the accident. And so I think that would be a case that fits that in a way that the, the doctor had an experience with the patient's dead wife during the surgery, so similar. And as I think about this, I'll probably think of others. But again, I'm sorry that this is sort of off the cuff tonight, but uh, I hope we all. Yeah. So looking forward to being with you this week. And uh, thank you so much again for having me here. Just